Okay, so let's talk about sex. Um, very complicated issue, especially with humans and human sexuality. There's whole courses on this, but we're going to look at just a few of the biological components of sexual development, sexual orientation, uh, different stages of, of love and falling in love, and a, look a little bit at the brain and a little bit at some neuroscience. Well, most animals, including humans, but not as much, um, they show a sexual dimorphism, died meaning two, two stages, especially like in things like the peacock and here some orangutans and, and sheep. They have a difference between males and females, but you also see sexual dimorphic behavior, which can be influenced by the season and by the development and uh, production of certain types of hormones. So here are some sheep that, you know, they get along uh, year, all year long until it's mating season and then they start pounding their head against each other. So um, sexual dimorphic uh, structures and sexual dimorphic behavior is a big part of what a lot of animal behaviors study and some comparative psychologists, people who study animals and, uh, and their behavior. But let's look a little bit at development. Okay, you've probably had this lesson before, at least I hope you have, but when um, you produce sex cells, um, you divide the number of chromosomes that you have. Normally you have 46, you divide that in, by the pair. So you have, pair, you have 23 pairs. You have two ones, two twos, two threes. And the 23rd pair is the, is the sex chromosomes. Females have XX and they produce eggs with only X and a male can produce a Y sperm, one that has the not an X and a Y but just a Y in it and that individual if everything goes well and doesn't always go well develops into a male and the X, uh, X will get together and form a female. Um, you can see here that you know a, a Y chromosome is actually a little bit smaller and the sperm is a little bit smaller. A little smaller, a little faster, but doesn't last as long. Don't read into that. So here are the here's the X and Y chromosome. You can see the Y chromosome really doesn't have a lot of genetic material in it. Uh, the X chromosome has a lot of genetic material and sometimes there can be genetic disorders where an, a recessive allele can be found on an X chromosome and there's nothing on the Y. These are known as sex-linked traits and a lot of times sex-linked traits occur more often in males because it, it, there's no dominant here to make it a heterozygote so that the recessive allele doesn't express itself, itself so you end up with the expression of that recessive allele which can produce a lot of um, a lot of problems. Now sometimes um, there can be ha there can happen where uh, the X and the Y um, aren't either produced into sperm or are there more than one produced into a, a sperm or an egg and this can most likely cause a spontaneous miscarriage but not always because the X and Y chromosome are actually pretty small and don't produce a lot of genetic material. So take for example what's known as Turner's syndrome. This is where there is an X either from the male or the female but there's no other um, chromosome there. There's no an extra X or an extra Y and this individual doesn't happen that often but they tend to have a little bit shorter stat, uh, stature, a little thicker neck, and it, it really kind of varies, but oftentimes the IQ is a little bit below normal, but not, not um, completely abnormal. And again, this is a case where usually the fetus spontaneously uh, aborts, but, but not always. So here is an example of the chromosomes. Now you can look here and you can see that the chromosomes are numbered and the bigger the chromosome, the lower the number. So chromosome one is huge. If you, if there's not um, a, a fourth chromosome, that 
uh, embryo is not going to develop. But up here, you might have an extra 21st chromosome. That's somebody with Down syndrome. Or even a 20th chromosome. Um, th these are smaller, and uh, an individual can survive. So let's talk about development. At six weeks, once the egg and the sperm get together, we have what's called a zygote, which is a fertilized egg, and it begins to develop uh, into the four-cell stage and the eight-cell stage, and it, it, it develops. And at about six weeks, you, uh, the little embryo has what are known as primordial gonads. That is a great two-letter phrase for psychology, primordial gonad. Now, this tissue um, can either become an ovary or a testy. It depends on certain expressions of genes on the Y chromosome. You see, the, the little fetus at this age can develop into a male or a female, um, either one. It's one of the reasons that males have nipples. I bet you've always wondered this. It's because nipples are developing before the embryo know what it's going to develop into. So let's say there is a Y chromosome. That Y chromosome, that tiny little Y chromosome, it does have one gene that produces a certain protein. It's known as the SRY gene. That produces a testis determining factor. And this protein goes to the developing primordial gonad and will tell that primordial gonad to turn into testes as opposed to ovaries. Without the SRY gene, in other words, two X chromosomes, the default is to turn into ovaries. So now we're up to about three months. And three months, you have the ducts that feed the uh, testes or the ovaries. And we have two types of ducts. We have a male and a female type of ducts that haven't developed yet. But you have both of them at this stage. You have the Wolfian system, and you have the Malarian system. The Wolfian system and the Malarian system. The Wolfian, if it has enough um, androgen or testosterone, will develop into the ducts leading from the testes to the penis. And if it doesn't, then the default is the malarian system. So the testes secrete two hormones. If there's an SRY gene and the testes develop, it produces androgen. One of the most common types of androgen is testosterone. I think you've heard of that. But it also produces another hormone called the anti-mullerian hormone. So the testes are producing androgen, which helps to turn the Wolfian system into the male um, ducts, and it produces a substance that makes the mullerian system um, degenerate. So these combine to what's known as masculinize the internal um, and external uh, genitalia of the male. So here we are, we're starting with this system that's in all fetus. This is the primordial gonad. It can, it has the malarian system, it has the wolfian system, and if the primordial gonad becomes uh, testes, then it produces the anti-malarian system, and it produces androgen, and we get this system here, the testes, and then we get into the vas deferens and the um, epididymis, and then we're developing into a male. If, the, if that isn't there, if the testes aren't developing, no androgen, no malarian, anti-malarian substance, then the development is for the malarian system to turn into the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the upper part of the vagina. There are cases, though, where there's androgen in the system, there's testes and androgen, but the system, the Wolfian system, is not sensitive to it. We have an insensitivity to androgen. This is known as androgen insensitivity syndrome. The, um, it lacks the ability to use the androgen. So, but it still has the anti-mullerian hormones. So the internal ducts for female aren't developing very well, but the, the, the little fetus is not being masculinized by the androgen because it's insensitive to it. So it causes the development of what looks like a female, but it could be an XY individual. This person might not even recognize that they're XY until they get genetic testing, and it, they're usually um, infertile, so that they'll go to a fertility specialist and, and try to discover why they aren't fertile. It's because the Mullerian system didn't develop properly. So this is kind of a good flow chart to go through and follow what happens. 
x, y, you can see how this follows, and x, x, and you can see how this follows. Androgen is important here, no hormones are here. Well, what about behavior? Well, sexual behavior in humans and even non-human mammals, very complicated. So we'll just talk a little bit about it. You know, in a lot of mammals, um, females, their estrus coincides with ovulation. They display, they go into heat like dogs do. In humans and some other primates, they kind of hide ovulation, so it's, it's, it's not as obvious. And what influences, and we'll get to this later, sort of sexual motivation can be levels of testosterone both in males and females. Females do have testosterone. It uh, primarily comes from their adrenal gland. Uh, but there's kind of this big kick about people buying testosterone supplements because you have low T and it's supposed to increase your sex drive. Well, the, the testosterone has to get pretty low for that to happen. Once testosterone is at a good level, then adding a bunch more testosterone is really not going to promote a, a stronger sex, sex drive necessarily. So while testosterone influences sexual behavior, um, not beyond normal limits with extra testosterone, it can also influence other behavior, extra testosterone. If, for example, a, a male is aggressive, already aggressive, the testosterone can exacerbate that aggression. Um, what about people who take things that mimic testosterone? Because testosterone, in addition to doing a lot of things, it can facilitate the development of muscles. And so some might take a synthetic uh, testosterone to if they're bodybuilding. And that can do a lot of things. It can um, produce kidney problems and high blood pressure. But it can also reduce sperm count. Because in order for sperm to be created, there has to be testosterone. Testosterone facilitates the development of sperm. But a synthetic version doesn't do that. And so somebody whose muscles get really, really big because they're taking steroids, one, if they're aggressive, they can get more aggressive. But two, they, can, they have a lot of infertility problems and low sperm count. Urgh. Testosterone. Okay, what about the brain? Well, the brain's a lot more complicated. The brain does have, uh, gets influenced, gets masculinized, gets feminized um, by levels of testosterone. It might be that testosterone, though, is converted in the brain into an, est an estrogen-like hormone, which then masculinizes the brain. It's kind of complicated how this might be working, but um, the testosterone is high levels in the blood are eventually going to make it to the brain. They might be turned into an estrogen-like substance which masculinizes the brain. But let's take a couple of structures. There's a few here. One is called the sexual dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, or the SDNPOA. I'll try to remember that. Um, we see this structure as larger in male rats than females. It grows rapidly in newborns if they're injected with androgen. Even if a female is injected with androgen, a testosterone, this structure will grow. And you can kind of see it here, looking at a cross cut, the uh, sexual dimorphic nuclei in the, in the hypothalamus. It's larger in males. Uh, and it does play a role in sexual behavior because if you add testosterone even to females, this area will grow and they will act in uh, a sexual behavior towards other females when they become adults. If you block it, if you block androgen from getting to the um, sexual dimorphic nuclei, then the male rat will show sexual preference towards other male rats and show more feminine-like uh, sexual uh, behavior. Now the humans have a structure called the interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus you can see it down here. And some people think this is sort of analogous to the sexual dimorphic nucleus. So what are some differences between the male and female brain? There are differences. Um, and so let's look at a few structures here. Um, the corpus callosum, the part that feeds the two sides of the brain, is a little bit larger in females. Um, frontal cortex can be lateralized a little bit different 
uh, hippocampus, um, parietal cortex, a little bit lateralized. Amygdala, the amount of connections to and from the amygdala can differ between males and females. What about sexual orientation? This is the gender of the preferred partner. Heterosexual, hetero means different. Um, and so this is somebody who is sexually attracted to the opposite sex, homosexual, homo meaning same, same sex, bisexual. Um, there are a number diff of different sexual uh, preferences. Now for a long time it might have been thought of as how this individual was raised and whether they had a domineering mother and whether they had a permissive father and blah 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 blah. And there's no good indication that the childhood experiences, the socialization influences uh, sexual preference or modeling for that ex for for that matter because homosexual couples that raise children the children have no more likelihood of becoming homosexual or heterosexual than the general public it's not this modeling kind of issue and so we get into these kind of two theories of sexual orientation one is called a social constructionism that means that it's socialized that it's taught that it's modeled that it's learned this is not a strong theory in psychology or biology. And then there's the no, what's known as the essentialism idea, that it's part of nature, that we are born w with the sexual orientation that we're going to have. I mean, think about your sexual orientation. Who do you prefer to be attracted to? Could anybody teach you to do the opposite? Could, um, is it something that you had to be taught or it's something that you just, it just came naturally? So there's a lot of um, indication that it's genetically influenced strongly. Um, there might be some influences of hormone levels and things like this. Um, but uh, it is, in terms of psychology and biology, it is a perfectly natural state to be in any of these states, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual. These are naturally occurring um, sexual orientations and in fact we see all sorts of sexual orientations in many other animals, especially the primates. And the other idea is that homosexuals don't have the level of testosterone heterosexuals do. That's not true uh, either. There's a slight difference, slight difference in that homosexual females have a slightly higher level of testosterone than heterosexual, but that number is pretty, pretty small. Might be a level of testosterone exposure in the fetus. Um, there are some indications of that if a female, um, if a mother has several sons, the more sons she has, the more likelihood that the, the later sons will become um, homosexual it has to do with sort of the body's, um, the female body's ability to um, block a little bit of the influence of testosterone when the male is developing. But these ideas are still rather controversial. But there are also some structural differences in the brain. Uh, for example, studies of post-mortem brains, uh, homosexuals and heterosexual males found differences, differences where a homosexual male's brain, the interstitial nucleus of the hypothalamus, the anterior hypothalamus, um, is a little bit smaller in homosexuals. The suprachiasmatic nucleus has been found to be larger in homosexual males. Um, so there are some structural differences. Um, for example, the lateralization that we see in heterosexual males isn't seen as often in homosexual males. <clears throat> so here's the interstitial nucleus, heterosexual, homosexual, it's just a little bit bigger in heterosexual males. But there's a lot of questions of whether this is caused by genetics, which probably has an influence, or behavior. Or behavior influences um, these structures as well. There's also some ideas that there's a strong genetic component. Um, for example, if you look at monozygotic twins, identical twins, there's a very strong concordance. We talk about concordance as being likely in one and likely in the other. So 52% of identical twins, um, if a male is homosexual, 52% probability that the that the brother is homosexual in in dizygotic twins or or fraternal twins there's, it's a high probability so there's some genetics more so than the general public 
But this also tells us that there are other influences. There are other influences. And the concordance in females is 48% for monozygotic twins and 16 for fraternal. You have to understand this is a very complicated thing. Uh, influenced strongly by biology and um, certainly not something that can be taught or changed. This um, therapy to try to change somebody's homosexuality extremely damaging to that individual. It doesn't work well. So it could be level of exposure to hormones. It could be genetic influences, probably all of these things. Um, not good evidence for parenting styles, as I mentioned. And it's something to keep in mind, especially as a psychologist, um, that homosexuals, bisexuals, are no more responsible for their sexual orientation than heterosexual. Um, so it's not something to see as to be altered, to be changed. If somebody is homosexual and maybe they come into your office and you go, well, have you tried to be heterosexual? Would you ask that question if somebody was heterosexual? They come in, they say, I'm having relation problems. I'm heterosexual. They go, hmm, really? Hmm, yeah. Have you, have you tried being homosexual? That's, that's a question you wouldn't ask. So you wouldn't ask that of a homosexual individual. We also know that it has been taken off the diagnostic tool for psychological disorders since 1973. Um, this American Life is a radio program that did a whole series on, on that process. Uh, it is not considered a psychological um, disorder in, in any fashion. Homosexuality might not be as common as heterosexuality, but perfectly, perfectly natural. But we also need to understand that a lot of the people in this world don't accept homosexuality. And you as a psychologist have to be well aware that homosexuals, especially teens, um, feel isolated, drop out, have higher suicide rates. Um, and in, in our society, though it's getting better, I found some statistics about this. I mean, these are hard numbers. 80% harassed about sexual orientation. 97% of students hear anti-gay comments. Um, do you ever just use anti-gay comments? Um, they, they seem to be um, almost acceptable in times in, in group settings, and they shouldn't be. Uh, so while I've seen a lot of improvement in our society, especially lately, uh, it's still a, an issue of great concern. Um, if you look at societies that are accepting of homosexuality, Europe has, has definitely done a little better about this job than we have, um, but we're, we're moving in those directions, hoping that the younger generation, uh, this isn't an issue, this isn't an issue. Uh, in the future. Now, what about legality? So, same-sex marriage is allowed in many places. It's starting to be allowed in different parts of our country. and But in some places, people can go into prison. There's uh, even death penalty for homosexuality, especially in the Middle East and, and uh, Northern Africa. And uh, these, are, these are big concerns. Well, what about our society? You know, we look at these individuals and more and more they're seen as being some pretty lousy people, um, uh, pretty discriminatory, uh, and they are. Uh, and I'm glad we can see them that way. But we also, what about just the general public? Uh, maybe they don't walk around with these signs, but they can still act discriminatory. Uh, this actually came out in 2007, so hopefully we've improved, but while hate crimes are down, anti-gay crimes are, st are up, uh, and hopefully those level out, but in many parts of the our country, um, anti-gay um, slurs and anti-gay discrimination is still in some ways acceptable. Do something about that. Okay, so let's talk about love and infatuation. Uh, I really highly recommend this book, um, Why We Love, by Helen Fisher. She's written a number of books. It's really about the nature and the chemistry of what's happening when we're in love. And, you know, we, we pair bond, we fall in love. You know, our human animal is a very um, fragile thing when it's born. The babies were known as altricial. Altricial means born fragile. And we need a lot of care. And oftentimes... Uh, a community and, and couples and two people caring for our 
our fragile little baby is a better thing and so we've evolved to have these pair bondings to have these connections um, and it's a wonderful thing and uh, so we can look at a little bit about the neurochemistry and the and, and the biology of of love so Fisher talks about three stages of love well there's the lust and this is this is getting us out there right this is the drive to seek out mates um, testosterone estrogen these are things that push us out there this is the looking phase attraction might be involved with other things like adrenaline and dopamine and cortisol and serotonin we'll talk about that in a minute and then the attachment phase the long-term connection a whole different hormone set involved in that the stability of it all so she talks about that attraction phase the falling in love phase as being kind of a love sickness um, we get activity in an area of the brain called the ventral tegmental area which is a dopamine system and it feeds up to another area called the nucleus accumbens we're going to talk a lot about that when we talk about addiction addiction to cocaine and methamphetamine and now if you are falling in love and you see that person you're in love with it's like getting a hit of cocaine it's and you become almost addicted to that individual high dopamine activity can't get them out of your brain invasive thoughts we also show similarities to obsessive compulsive disorder this is an imbalance of low level of serotonin 5-hydroxytryptamine is serotonin and if you again that obsessive nature of falling in love with somebody you know this individual you know did some studies they looked at people who were just falling in love and compared that to people with obsessive compulsive disorder a disorder of an imbalance of serotonin and that compared to uh, normal people that aren't going a little crazy falling in love or not obsessive compulsive and re results showed that the OCD students and the people who were just falling in love had lower levels of serotonin in their blood so I mean we've all kind of experienced this when you're first falling in love you wake up thinking about them you go to bed thinking about them you can't get them out of their out of your brain I hope you're not falling in love while taking this class because you'll get nothing done in this class in that process I well okay I, I disagree I hope you're falling in love um, <clears throat> but the nice thing about falling in love is after you're in love and you're attached or hopefully you're at, you have this attachment you haven't broken up that the serotonin comes back uh, you can get the the adrenaline that when you see them the adrenaline isn't as powerful this the norepinephrine isn't as powerful the dopamine the addiction isn't as powerful uh, and you can uh, you know get some stuff done but then why do you stay together um, it doesn't mean that there isn't some dopamine and attraction and, and, and adrenaline there but the these things kind of get back to normal but we still have a, an attachment a bonding a connection and these are certainly social conventional um, but there's some biology there too for example oxytocin oxytocin is a wonderful hormone it's uh, created in the hypothalamus it's stored in the posterior pituitary it's a hormone that is released um, to help in milk production in females it helps in uterine contraction during birth um, it is released during orgasm uh, in both male and both sexes male and when they ejaculate when they uh, uh, have orgasms oxytocin is released so is vasopressin we'll get to that but we also see these levels um, high when we're around the people we are attached to it helps the bonding I mean the idea is that it's produced a lot when a little baby comes out and so there's this attachment to the baby who needs a lot of help we even see oxytocin levels go up with the father in the delivery room this is that attachment that bonding that's so important but it's also important in bonding between people and um, it increases with long-term relationship plays a, a role in keeping people together um, vasopressin does this as well in males uh, vasopressin is a hormone released from the uh, posterior pituitary has a lot to do with water regulation in the kidney but also might be playing a role in bonding 
So let's take the example of the little prairie vole. There's a prairie vole and then there's this other rodent that's very similar to a prairie vole. And, and the, some prairie voles mate for life. These wonderful little creatures, they, they uh, get little prairie vole married. And they have high oxytocin, they bond with each other. But if the female is injected with oxytocin, um, they can stay pair bonded. But if given an antagonist, they do not. They, she doesn't show those bonding behaviors. You could take another similar rodent to a vole and uh, inject it with oxytocin, and suddenly they became like these lover prey voles. They bond with each other. Um, vasopressin does the same in males. If you take a prairie vole and they're bonding and you give them a vasopressin antagonist, he'll stop the bonding. He'll start looking around. He'll stop guarding his mate. So here's a funny little cartoon before mating. If a male is injected with vasopressin, he's in love, even if he's not a pair bonding vole. If female is injected with oxytocin, she becomes like a prayer bonding vole. Of course, the other little rodent's like, what the heck? And if they are, if a male is given an antagonist to vasopressin, he doesn't want a pair bond. And if the female is given an antagonist, look at that little loser, that's so sad, then she doesn't want a pair bond. Well, you know, humans are mammals too. We have vasopressin and oxytocin. Uh, these may be playing a role in in bonding. So when looking at a functional MRI, um, these are the areas that kind of light up. When you view a person you love rather than like, these areas start to increase and these areas tend to decrease. You know what the prefrontal cortex does? It helps you plan, helps you rationalize things. Uh, it decreases when you're falling in love. You, you go a little insane. Uh, you're not as rational. Uh, and yet you are uh, highly motivated to seek out the person you love. Love is a sickness. If you have a friend falling in love, be a little compassionate. If somebody is falling in love with you, remember they're, they're going through a little bit of craziness. Um, be kind.